Hello, and thank you for joining us for what I'm sure will be another great session of the RTPI NAEP Enforcement Week programme. Uh, this webinar is part of a programme of events that is run over the course of this week, covering a superb range of topics. And as a reminder, you can watch them all again or see any that you've missed on the catch up on the RTPI uh, YouTube channel. My name is Scott Stemp. I'm a planning barrister at Number Five Chambers, and I will be your chair for today's session getting it right, the enforcement notice. Please remember, there is a Q&A session at the end of today's presentations where you can put questions to any of today's speakers. Questions can be submitted for the panel through the GoTo software using their question facility, which you can see on your screens now. Well, today we have a fantastic panel for you. Shortly, we're going to hear from Tom Wicks, the Director of Enforcement Services, and Beverly Smith, the Building Standards and Development Manager with Moray Council. But first, however, we're going to hear from Marcus Bayona Martinez. Marcus joined the Vale of Glamorgan Council as a student planner in development management while studying at Cardiff. He's now a planner in the Vale's appeals and enforcement team and is also studying for his master's degree. Today, Marcus is going to speak to us. Well, I thought about dealing with some problematic decking, but I wondered if it was more the problematic owners. Over to you, Marcus. Thanks, Scott, for the introduction. Um, so, hello to all of you uh, listening. For those of you who tuned into my presentation yesterday, um, I'm hoping that I don't have the same technical issues and uh, that we can go ahead without those. <laughs> so, I'm going first in a series of presentations on getting the enforcement notice right. And I'm actually going to be talking to you about an enforcement notice that was actually overturned at appeal. But bear with me, um, there's a good reason for that. So, I'm taking a case study approach uh, to get my, across, uh, my message. Um, which is ensuring that the right outcome, and that's the most important part. I presented on this case last year at the Welsh Planning Enforcement Conference, and the reason for that presentation was to bring attention to the condition that the planning inspector chose to put on uh, approval. We'll also touch on that as it created a fair bit of debate at last year's conference. So, the site is located in Barry, which is one of the largest towns in Wales. Um, the site's a two story semi detached dwelling, and it's served by a large rear garden. The surrounding street is pretty similar in design and style. Uh, now, to its immediate rear is Porth Kerry Country Park, and it's a lot more exciting than the house, which is why I've included a photo of me there um, about last year sometime. Really nice place if you're ever in Barry and get the chance to go there. Um, so, onto the breach. Um, the breach of control in uh, this presentation uh, relates to a raised decking at the rear of the property, which you can see here on the right hand side. Um, so, as I say, I did a presentation yesterday, and that was on a site for 2,000 houses. And I think this case, compared to that one, is really a reflection of the scope of our job and the very various situations that we have to deal with. Um, so, moving on, uh, the case, uh, the decking in this case, was between 0.7 and 1.2 metres. Um, so, as most of you are probably aware, that means that it would require planning permission as it's over 0.3 metres. And part one class E of the GPDO uh, means that permission is required. At least that's the case in Wales. So after identifying the breach, we requested an application. We also had to identify the harm um, from the breach to ascertain whether it was expedient to pursue this as a matter that might need an enforcement notice. It didn't take long before we realised that there was unacceptable overlooking from uh, the raised deck in, into the neighbour's window, which you can see there. Um, there were fairly intense views from it, and this was from the majority of angles. And as a result, this problem needs to be addressed. Due to its height, it wasn't as though the neighbour could um, put up a two metre fence under permitted development either, so that wouldn't have removed the harm that the neighbour was complaining about. So, in order to eliminate the harm caused by the development, uh, we considered the installation of a privacy screen up to about 1.8 metres in height would be essential. Um, it was considered that an application was needed so that we could condition that the privacy screen remains in perpetuity. Um, discussion with the owner went on for quite a while and uh, there was a lot of back and forward uh, between the two of us and it went around in circles a bit. One day he was submitting an application, the next he was going to be knocking the whole raised platform down. Um, it just went like that. I'm sure that a lot of you have got um, similar cases that you can think of when I talk about a situation like that. Um, in the end, after a few months of uh, going back and forward, we decided that the only situation and way to move forward was to serve an enforcement notice. 
So we still have an enforcement notice under Section 172 of the Town and Country Planning Act, um, which, as enforcement officers, I'm sure we're all familiar with. Section 172 doesn't really allow a mechanism um, that would have given us the opportunity to require the owner to install a privacy screen, which would have overcome the harm. Um, so we could only remove the harm. And that meant we had to require the deck and be removed and um, get all of the debris from that that resulted off the land. We gave a two month compliance period for that. So the site owner employed a consultant and decided to appeal our notice. For the first time, the owner acknowledged the harm that was caused by the raised decking and finally agreed with our view that it afforded unacceptable views into the neighbour's living room. As a result of this, they suggested the installation of a privacy screen along the boundary between the two dwellings. The appellant's statement identified that this would overcome concerns of overlooking and would not have had any inverse, adverse impacts visually or in terms of overbearing. Although we would always defend the service of the notice and request that the appeal against it be dismissed, otherwise why serve the notice, in view of the new position taken uh, by the site owner, we would have been in an indefensible situation and we didn't think that, that maintaining this course of action was the correct route to go down. A lot of this decision impinged on the fact that, as mentioned, an extension can be installed in this location up to four metres in height and the privacy screen would be approximately three metres at its greatest. In response, our written statement concluded that the inspector should allow the appeal under ground A and ground plan admission on the basis that condition was attached um, by the inspector's decision. Um, we, in, sorry, we inspected, suggested to the inspector that the condition that you can see on the screen should be added to the permission. We still have concerns about the percentage design of the screen, so we request the details of the privacy screen be submitted and approved within six weeks, and that the privacy screen should be installed six weeks after the approval of the details. So this was a condition that we felt was similar to a lot that are used in enforcement situations where there aren't really any other triggers, but you need something installed to overcome harm that can be retained in perpetuity. So why did we take this compromise? Um, we took this position um, in hindsight, it appeared quite obvious from the offset that we should have uh, gone down this route and um, once they'd appealed, but it did take a small week, uh, while to realize that um, and how it would just achieve our desired outcome. Uh, the course of action is always to reduce the harm. Uh, the site owner had agreed to install the privacy screen and we'd been requesting that from the start. That was the reason there was public interest in serving the notice in the first instance and so it's in the public interest ultimately to concede and ask for the um, notice to be overturned. The notice was used as a means to an end and I'm not sure that's always the case especially when a desire to maintain uh, statistics comes into play. However it worked here. Sometimes and as we did in this case you have to accept that a loss is a win in some ways and although it will go against targets it's the correct and best outcome. So um, given all that I've told you so far um, we weren't too surprised to find that the appeal was allowed by the inspector. Um, however, this isn't quite the end of the story. The notice being overturned didn't make the issue go away and there was still a fair bit of legwork. Um, first, this is the condition that the inspector chose to add to the grant planning permission. Please don't try to read it all. Um, we'll break it down now. I've taken the brave option to fill this slide with text. It's not something that you usually see, but it's just to highlight the um, confusion really and how much how big this condition was uh, that the inspector attached. Last time I presented on this case, this was my final slide. We left it up and I also handed a copy out to the audience. Then a room full of enforcement officers had a good natter and uh, critiqued it a little bit. However, I don't have those privileges this time, so um, we'll just uh, go along with how we dealt with it. Here I've highlighted the segments um, of the condition that ended up being essential in the long run. So please draw attention to those and feel free to overlook the rest. Um, it took some deliberation, but we agreed that the correct interpretation of this condition was that within six months of the date of non-compliance with any of the four points, the decking had to be demolished. In reality, it took um, two months and they failed to comply with the first trigger, which was a submission of details. So this meant that the homeowner had to fall back on the requirement then to demolish the decking within six months. However, the situation at the site changed after this. Um, after about three months of not submitting details, I went to see if the uh, decking was still in situ, and it was. I then noticed that the house had been sold. So this changed the condition, uh, the situation at the site a little bit. Um, so they had a further three months until the six months period for demol demolishing the raised platform uh, came about. 
and I had to contact a new owner and inform them of this in quite um, a short period of time and we had to, yeah, we had to find a way to uh, resolve an issue. The new owner was aware of the appeal but had not been informed about the condition that the inspector had attached. The new owner thought that any planning issues relating to the decking were over and he could keep it. Um, I had to bring the new owner around to this and um, essentially get across to him that he was going to be in breach of a planning condition and liable to enforce the notice and how um, a breach condition notice um, and how failure to comply with that would have resulted in prosecution. So this left him particularly alarmed. We proposed a number of ways forward and at a number of stages it seemed like the owner would be putting in a screen and submitting a non-material amendment um, so that we could in, put in place the in perpetuity condition. However, the ad, ultimate outcome was demolition. Now, um, excuse the excuse the animations, I have to put them in somewhere across two slides though. Um, so the owner chose to demolish it at the start of lockdown and this was the resulting outcome. It's back down to its original level and there's now a two meter fence um, in place, which, well, the privacy screen would have had to have gone about a meter higher than that again, if it were to um, have protected the views into the neighbor's dwelling. So we're outcome, uh, happy with this outcome anyhow. Um, it was a bit of an awkward situation as the owner informed me that one of the main reasons he bought this house was a part of the reason um, was because of the raised decking at the back. Um, in this situation, as I've said already, we couldn't serve a notice that immediately got rid of the car, one which uh, required a privacy screen. We had to serve a notice as a means to an end, and this meant we had to recommend to the inspector overturn our own notice. Despite that unorthodox move, in this case, it resulted in the development and resultant harm being removed. Um, although that didn't have to be the case, in our view, this was a success, a success as the harm was removed. So um, that's all for me um, on this presentation and this week. I hope you've taken something away from it um, and the one the presentation that I did yesterday. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations that are to come. OK. Thank you very much, Marcus. It's uh, quite bizarre, really, isn't it? How sometimes it takes the issue of an enforcement notice to get people to move towards something that could have been achieved sooner and more easily by discussion and negotiation, despite uh, seemingly the authority getting a result and the owner seemingly getting something of a result and then effectively walking away from it. Anyway, next we have for you Tom Wicks. Tom is a Director of Enforcement Services. Uh, he's a Chartered Town Planner and has a Master's Degree in Law. He is also NAEP's Southeastern Representative. Tom is experienced in all aspects of planning from site visits through to public inquiries and direct action. And he's going to talk to us today about identifying and describing the breach. Over to you, Tom. Hello, I assume everybody can hear me. Uh, yesterday I had some issues where um, I was talking for a while without anyone hearing me, but um, somebody flagged it up pretty quickly, so I, I assume you can hear me. Um, yes, today I'm going to talk about HMOs um, or shared accommodation in general um, and the reason for this is the sort of over the last 10 years the government have changed a few of the rules surrounding uh, changing properties, dwelling houses into flats or shared accommodation um, and that has resulted in a number of stories, most recently about um, flats without windows and that sort of thing, but but the cases that we've been dealing with certainly uh, were highlighted by uh, the Guardian in this article. Um, and we've been probably had about 50 or 60 of these cases that have gone to appeal in the last few years. Uh, houses in multiple occupation have been part of the general housing stock for, for decades and they are an important feature of it. Uh, they, they, they're they good for students, they're good for traveling workers, friends, whatever. They provide a flexible way of living um, that should be fairly cheap and affordable, um, often short term and allows people who know each other usually uh, but want to live separately or, or whatever just to sort of flexibly live in, in one house. Um, but they're not really designed for vulnerable people, so people with 
addiction problems, alcohol problems, uh, mental health problems. And uh, the last thing that those types of people really want is to be crammed in a house that's just not suitable, that's overcrowded, that doesn't give them enough room uh, with six other people with similar issues. Um, but by the way, in, in the government's wisdom in 2010 and 2014, rules were changed to introduce the C4 use class, which is the uh, HMO of not more than six people. And the GPDO was changed to allow a dwelling house to change into a HMO. Um, on one hand, that created uh, a, a flexible housing stock, so homeowners could change their house to, to a HMO to allow for students to live in, for example, or whatever, and again revert back to their single dwelling house use. Um, but on the other, it created a not the, not the change itself, but the the opportunity it presented to some landlords was basically to create modern day slums. So you take your traditional two bedroom house, sort of two bedrooms on the top of a reasonable size, two bedrooms on the uh, two rooms on the bottom, a living room, a kitchen, or whatever, and you rearrange it uh, so that it now has six small rooms and a shared kitchen and if that's not flats if it's a hmo if it's a shared if it's shared accommodation so that the occupiers of each room are are living in their room independently but sharing uh, facilities there's no need to get planning permission and i'll show you some of the um, conditions that we found in these properties as you can see that they're, they're pretty pretty awful Typically, these rooms are sort of anywhere between 10 and 20 square meters, um, which wouldn't meet the certainly the London plan housing housing uh, space standards. And, and I'm sure many other local authorities have, have space standards that are much more generous than that. Um, but of course, with the change from a dwelling house being uh, permitted development, no planning permissions required if it's a HMO. And so these the developers can, can get around those space standards. And this, this really presented a, a big opportunity for some developers. Although converting these houses into HMOs was um, easy to do, it didn't require planning permission, it didn't generate the kind of income that, that sort of they would expect because the housing allowance um, for a shared room in a HMO is about one third of the housing allowance you can get for a self-contained flat. So in other words, a, a, a one room in a HMO would generate the landlord £400 a month, but if it was a bedsit room, it would generate the landlord £1,000 a month. So you had a, a two bedroom house that was probably being rented out if it was rented out for somewhere in the region of a thousand pounds, fifteen hundred pounds to a family, a small family or a first time, you know, a small couple or whatever, uh, suddenly it could be rented out for six thousand pounds a month, which meant a massive opportunity for some landlords. But of course flats need planning permission. And so the clever scheme uh, was to on the one hand, tell the planning department that these properties were HMOs, that the rooms themselves, although they contained an ensuite, they didn't contain cooking facilities. Um, they had a shared kitchen and the tenants used that shared kitchen to cook. But on the other hand, they were telling the housing benefit department that these rooms were flats. So they would fill in, they would, and this is part of the reason that some landlords would select vulnerable tenants um, because they could complete the requisite forms for housing benefit for them. And the tenants were either unable to or 
not capable of challenging the landlord when they when they filled out these forms and the local authority would get the application that would say it's a one-bedroom flat and of course pay the higher rate and that meant these houses could be worth 50 grand a year in in housing benefit payments which presented a problem to local authorities because one these flats or HMOs are being occupied by six vulnerable people who shouldn't be crammed together in a small house. So it's no good for the vulnerable people. Um, two, the neighbours will often experience antisocial behaviour and, and problems with the, the tenants arguing with each other, etc. Um, it results in the loss of valuable family housing stock that otherwise wouldn't have been lost. Um, and it's just a, a genuine fraud. You can't, on the one hand, tell the planning department that this is a HMO, but on the other, tell the housing benefit department that they are flats. And so councils across, certainly in London, lots of London boroughs and across um, other cities in, in the UK, Peterborough, I know I've had some, Birmingham and Manchester, they've all experienced problems with this. Um, these types of houses were proliferating and they are re it is really at a massive scale. Some some landlord companies, or I've seen figures of having over 500 properties, all in the same model, all taking in housing benefit at the maximum rate, and providing horrible accommodation. Um, so the local authority wanted to do something about it, um, but found it difficult because one to get into these houses is difficult tenants tend to stay in their rooms they're used to strange comings and goings so they don't tend to answer the door they don't really want to speak to people so unannounced visits were often difficult and of course if you make an announced visit arranged through the landlord you would find that once you enter the rooms there were no cooking facilities despite there being kitchen worktops within the rooms or evidence of some cooking but no no cooking facilities at that time and some of the most unscrupulous landlords would even go to the lengths of hiding equipment on the day. So, and this isn't a joke, this isn't a, a made up story. I would, I would go and visit one of these properties and find in the wheelie bin outside a, a hot plate with an egg timer still running, where the landlord had just literally gone in just before we'd got there, taken out the tenants' cooking facilities and thrown them in the bin. And that presented the local authority with a real challenge. And the, the key was, if it's a HMO, it doesn't need planning permission, but if they are flats, they do. So establishing what constitutes a flat was, a flat was important. And you, probably most of you are aware of the, the old case of Gravesham that said, uh, to be a flat or dwelling house, it must provide all the facilities necessary for private day-to-day -day existence. And in the course of the appeals that we've dealt with, it's it's, been pretty much established that that means washing facilities, a toilet and uh, facilities to prepare hot food. And that can be as little as a microwave. And that's, that's where the real issue lies in that the provision of a microwave is, is very transient. You can put it in one day and take it out the next. And does that amount to a material change of use? It's very difficult to identify when that would amount to a change of use. And so when looking at these properties, it, it's important that rather than trying to generalise the nature of these properties, you must look at the specific, specific facts of the case. What evidence have you got? What have you found? Have you found evidence of cooking in all the rooms or just some of the rooms? Is there a communal kitchen? If there is a communal kitchen, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a shared house perfectly um, common to have a shared space within a block of flats, for example. Um, equally, you could have shared space in a HMO that is genuinely HMO, or you could have four flats and two rooms that are part of the HMO, so you could have a mixed use. And that's where the, the difficulty lies. So in all of these cases, it is really important 
to really forensically and analyze the evidence that you have and that could be in the way of housing benefit claims which often specifically state on them yes i have a a room i don't share it and it has all of these washing toilet and cooking facilities um, and it's important at, at that stage to really go through them in detail because often with their appeal forms and the evidence that is provided to the appeal uh, landlords and, and appellants will provide their own tenancy agreements which may not necessarily match the tenancy agreements that they provided to the housing benefit department it may be very subtle changes but very important that they are looked at uh, in, in real detail so that the breach is identified correctly again with all of these cases it is a matter of fact and degree and it is a matter of the specific um, facts of each case and then you turn to the requirements of the notice so if you've identified um, that the property is a block of flats or, or flats six flats in, a, in what was formerly a dwelling house then the notice should require those flats to cease and i think it's good practice in in any enforcement notice case really to copy and paste the breach into the requirements so that you avoid the trap of accidentally under enforcing um, and that's easy to do if you've got a mixed use for example if your enforcement notice says that the property is a mixed use of a hmo and flats for example it would be very easy to only require the flat use to cease or require the HMO use to cease um, which of course under enforces against the other and effectively grants an unconditional planning permission so it's really important that the requirements match the breach um, but like I say this is a live very live issue that that is being judged all over the place at the moment we're probably dealing with with about 30 appeals at the moment each of them following this exact same model so i i, I would stress that this is it is really a matter of um, the specific facts of the case and concentrate on the evidence that you've actually got not what you think is happening or what might be happening but what you actually have in front of you to frame your enforcement notice and to hopefully be successful at appeal. Uh, if anyone wants any other examples, um, especially appeal decisions that we've had relating to this issue, and we've had a few that, that um, seem to contradict each other, but, but they are decided on different facts, so, so that's fair, um, then please do get in touch. Uh, my email address is on the screen now if you need anything at all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, for talking us through some of the issues uh, encountered when dealing with unauthorised conversions, particularly, and the often problematic situations that the tenants of those properties uh, often find themselves in. Well, finally today, before we uh, turn to questions for the panel, we have our presentation from Beverly Smith. Currently, the Building Standards and Development Manager with Moray Council. Uh, Beverly has been a chartered town planner since 1994. Uh, she's worked previously for various planning authorities before joining Moray as a planning officer specialising in enforcement and working her way up to her current post, which includes having chaired Heads of Planning Development Management Subcommittee and having a place on the Heads of Planning Executive Committee. Beverly's going to talk us through lessons learned from enforcement action that uh, Moray took in relation to the raising of land levels. Over to you, Beverly. Thank you, Stan, for um, that introduction. Hopefully going to share my screen with you now. Really, this is a, a very simple case study. Unlike maybe um, Tom's presentation, it, it's quite a straightforward case. But what, it, it, what I'd like to do really is just to share some of those um, things that went wrong with our particular case and hope them that they help you with, with some of the action that you take in the future. So the title of the presentation is Enforcement Notice, how, how do you get it so wrong? So I'll, I'll quickly talk you through 
what the breach was. It was fairly straightforward. We had a complaint regarding some unauthorized raised levels um, next to a residential property. Um, and that was um, a difficult issue in terms of um, amenity. So there was no unauthorized development and we went through a, a series of actually um, getting a retrospective application in. That was assessed and it was dismissed on appeal. Just to maybe go through how it unfolded after serving the notice, we had two options. We detailed the notice to give, um, hopefully we thought, the um, contravener an option to either submit a plan to show how they wanted to reduce the ground levels to our satisfaction. And then the second option was if we didn't receive one, then the council would produce one um, for him. That was our first mistake, giving a choice in an enforcement notice. We then, as usual, went through the, um, an appeal route and the reporter identified that the decision notice on the, on the enforcement notice contained an anomaly. So that was our second mistake. And we thought, well, right, we're, we're not doing very well here. But for some reason we thought, well, um, because there was an anomaly, maybe a bit like um, Tom, we, did, we decided that, or was it Marcus at the beginning, we, we'd go back to the director um, for appeals and identify that. I think that was when it started to go badly wrong um, and they decided then that that would have to go to the court of session. So unexpectedly, the second decision notice was issued by the same reporter, um, quoting that um, the original enforcement notice was now a nullity because it was amb amb um, ambiguous. And that was down to some recent case law that we weren't aware of and that we shouldn't really have given the a choice at all. So I think really at this point, it, it was a point where we thought it, it couldn't really get any worse. So in summary, what we did following the reporter's decision, we, we'd spent enough time on it. We thought, right, let's get it right this time. We'll serve another notice. We'll produce a plan. We'll explain exactly in detail what the landowner's got to do. And therefore we, we should have no problem. So again, we had another appeal. This time it was dismissed and the landowner went over to comply with the terms of the notice and uh, we didn't actually need any direct action. We did really learn a lot from this experience, but the breach was resolved. But I think moving forward, um, what's important is really to look at some of the lessons that we, we learned over that. And there's probably some more as well. Um, in terms of the Section 272 notices that we've got in Scotland, that's there for us to um, identify who's got an interest in the land. So don't rely on the landowner giving you the correct information. Always make sure you do your own title search because there's definitely more than two or three people involved on, on most cases. All, always serve a separate notice as well on every individual party and they've got their own individual right of appeal. This, this next mistake was something that um, wasn't our, our team's fault, but we did have a, a red line on an enforcement notice and the, the notice referred to a colour and then when it got copied by another team, we sent out and issued a black and white version um, so that was another mistake. So we then had to, because of that reason, reserve a notice just to thought that we were doing the right thing. So you never really expect how many things can go wrong on one case. And I think this is a prime example as, as to how once, once you make one mistake, it seems like you never stop. Double check draft enforcement notices, make sure, clearly obvious thing to do, um, but make sure you do do it and that there's no ambiguities. We, we thought we were being reasonable in our notice and given a choice, but it didn't actually quite work out that way. Um, my enforcement officer um, at the moment basically said to me, patience is a virtue, you'll get there in the end. And I think that's something that we all know about. And I think from what Marcus and Tom have said earlier, it is important about serving notices where it's expedient to do so, where, where there's a reason. And also, in this case, there was an amenity issue to resolve. So um, hopefully most of you will learn not to do what we've done. And hopefully it's been some some help to you. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Beverly, for that uh, 
important, interesting exploration of the lessons learned for the detailed requirements concerning drafting and service of uh, enforcement notices. I'm uh, going to ask all of our speakers now to uh, come and rejoin us for uh, questions from the audience. So uh, if our speakers could come and join us now. I think uh, the first questions we've uh, got, we can kick off with uh, a couple of questions for uh, Marcus, uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, was a double fee paid at the appeal uh, for the decking? I presume it probably was. Yeah, um, I can't remember exactly off the top of my head. There's, uh, the appeal commenced in spring last year, but I'd envisaged that it was because that's per the regulations. And it's a bit ironic that they could have um, paid £190 for a householder application and got the same outcome, a conditioned consent for uh, the retention of the raised platform. Instead, they chose to pay double that. It was the route that they wanted to go down. We gave them a uh, full option to not go down that route. But yeah, I don't see um, any other way that they wouldn't have been able to pay the full double price. Oh, absolutely. And uh, and what was the um, what was the owner's issue with providing a privacy screen in the first place? Um, he was just quite uncompliant with and uncompromising with anything, essentially. Um, he wanted his privacy, his um, raised platform there as it was. He didn't want us to change it at all. And in enforcement, you do get people like this sometimes. It was his raised platform. Why would the council get involved in his raised platform? Um, I put it there, I paid for it. And that was about as far as we got with him a lot of times. Sometimes after a long conversation, um, you might get him around to your way of thinking and um, saying, well, what about the harm on the neighbor? But in the end, it never really uh, materialized to any sort of any action on site or input in an application. So yeah, that's how that worked out. And, and what, 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 what was the neighbor's view about the, about the privacy screen? Because uh, you, you, you mentioned in your talk that the, the fence that we saw in the photograph didn't quite come up as high as the privacy screen. So presumably yeah. there would have been some overshadowing from a privacy screen. The neighbor didn't want the privacy screen either. So we had a situation where the only way to remove the harm was to remove the raised platform or install a privacy screen. The neighbor's only view was that the whole decking had to go. Um, but we couldn't take that route when um, when you could put an extension there. Really, if we if we took that route, um, it, it was quite difficult for us to at the appeal stage to not agree with them to put the um, privacy screen in. But at the appeal stage, the neighbour objected to the um, privacy screen on the grounds of um, overbearing and overshadowing. But again, for the reasons in my uh, presentations, we couldn't go along those lines. Now, when the new owner moved in, um, they both, so the neighbour and the new owner came to me and said, well, how about we make an agreement whereby we don't put in a privacy screen now, um, neither, you know, we get along, um, the new neighbour, he's not looking into my um, house, like the old one was, this, that. And um, we found that, well, really, and it is our job to think about future generations, future owners, and we couldn't really cater to the preferences of the current owners. Um, it, you know, it's what always happens in enforcement, you can't really do that. So we catered to uh, potential future, future owners who wouldn't have the option to say, Oh well, I get on my with my neighbour in case the situation changed. So yeah, that's what they thought of that. They didn't like it either, but we can't help everyone. I but, think that's a common experience for everyone involved in enforcement, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Tom, I'm going to turn to you with a with a question um, about the approach that uh, you might advise authorities to take when they're trying to define the description of breach. Um, you talk to us about the context, particularly of. Uh, possible uh, flatted use or HMO use or maybe a mixed use um, in the context of vulnerable occupants particularly. Do you think, uh, would you advise or, or, or do you think uh, authorities you advise have a preference for harder evidence like documentary records or, or, or what is the extent of perhaps softer evidence, maybe statements and evidence from occupants who may be vulnerable? Uh, well, in terms of this case in particular um what's the, the the fundamental issue is the actual 
use that the property is put to. So whether or not you find cooking facilities or or a shared kitchen or whatever it might be, it might be indicative of the use, but it doesn't actually demonstrate the actual use that the premises is put to. So for example, your the landlord may say, well, we ban tenants from cooking in the rooms or we don't provide them with cooking facilities in their rooms. But that doesn't actually demonstrate the actual use. What would demonstrate the real use is how the occupiers of the premises actually use the premises. So if, for example, you have a six bedroom HMO um, where the tenants all say we cook in the rooms, regardless of whether you found cooking facilities or not, that demonstrates the actual use. And those tenants are the best people who can evidence that use. They're the ones who actually live there. So the preference will always be for live evidence, be it a, a, an inquiry or whatever, from the actual occupiers, people who have actually experienced the use of the premises. Uh, in terms of vulnerable tenants, that's sometimes difficult. They they might not understand the issues, they may not want to get involved. Um, a lot of the time with these premises in particular, we find that landlords have put pressure on the tenants not to speak to the council, um, whilst at the same time encouraging them to fill out their benefit forms in a specific way or, or to uh, let them fill them out for them. But equally, that can be helpful because if you've got a housing benefit form that purports to be from a tenant who has signed it and he's at penalty of um, a, a, a breaking the law if he's falsified it, then there's no better person to describe the nature of his, of his use and, and of his accommodation. So either the landlords have got to say, well, that tenant was lying, in which case, what, what possible motive could, could that tenant have for making up a housing benefit claim that he sees no rental income from? Or he can, or the landlord can say, "Well, I filled it out for him." In which case, he may obviously have a motive to indicate that it's a it's a flat rather than a shared room in a HMO. So I would always um, it's always preferable to have live evidence from the people who actually use the premises. Though, in the case of vulnerable tenants, that's that's not always possible. Mm. Um, and the, the thing to bear in mind is always that the burden of proof is always on the appellant. So if the accounts have alleged that it's a six flats and the appellant produces no evidence, then they're not going to win the, the appeal. Equally, if the council produce only a tiny bit more evidence than the appellant, then, then they're still going to win the appeal. So it's not a question of you need to prove beyond reasonable doubt that this is definitely flats. It's a question of on the balance of probability, what is it? And it's the appellant's burden to prove that whatever you've alleged in your notice is not right yes yes um beverly uh thank you for the, the uh talk on the uh the lessons to be learned from the uh in, seeming to be a what turned into a bit of a saga with the enforcement notice um you 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 mentioned to us about the retrospective application that had been made and, and that being dismissed um and the authority wanting to to take a uh, a, a helpful approach and give options for compliance. How, how did those options for compliance relate to what was proposed to be retained in the retrospective application? What was what was unacceptable about the retrospective application that the options for compliance sought to sort of remedy and 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 make acceptable? I think from recollection it wasn't just for the unauthorised work, it was for some other element that was unacceptable in itself, so it wasn't just for the um, engineering operation, it was for an additional element and it was that that was in combination that was unacceptable, so. Um, oh, I so see. Case, yeah. Yeah. And, um, um, having a retrospective application can sort out a lot of problems um and obviously you know we've all got our enforcement charters and that's that's the route that we try and do in terms of regularizing development and it's a positive way of doing it but um doesn't always work out no no and and what was what was the uh, effect on the authority on really discovering that it, it wasn't able to to be as helpful as it wanted to be and and to provide the options uh for compliance 
I think it's, it's just made us really realise now that um, we have to be quite black and white in terms of what our enforcement notices um, detail when we draft them. Um, you know, really, we thought we were being helpful. We thought it was giving a choice, and I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, maybe other authorities have done the same. But now we're, we're fairly clear that if we do ask somebody to do something, um, it's crystal clear and there's no ambiguity at all. And I think that's where um, you spend so much time getting to that point and the enforcement process is a long process and often drawn out because of every notice generally gets appealed against um, that to have to do it two or three times um, is, is something that you want to try and avoid. So certainly I think, I can't remember we've had anything um, since then of that nature anyway. So we've, we've learned our lesson, I think. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I was going to ask, to, to what extent do you think your authority is, is going to want to try and be as helpful now as, as it was in, in that case? No, I think in any future cases that we get, it is just going to be a matter of um, either cease the use or remove whatever, rather than trying to um, draft something over complicated. I mean, I think we're all used to drafting planning decision notices with conditions that um, meet circular tests and you know we're all very good at that when you try and do that in an enforcement notice you try and use some of the skills that you've got but I think my experience is that you don't know, necessarily think that you're going to be able to get away with being helpful and sometimes at the end of the day you're in a situation where there's been a breach of planning control it's not been regularized you're having to serve a notice and go down that road um, and, and therefore there are maybe less options than what you'd like to do if you're actually dealing with a planning condition. Mm. I'll just make a quick point. There is, um, if you are confused about what the actual breach is going to be, if the if the developer is being unhelpful and won't help you identify what it is, or you, you can't get on site, and there's a few options that you think might be occurring, there's nothing to stop you issuing more than one notice that covers different breaches. And then once the developer says, well, actually these two are wrong and this one's right, you can withdraw the other two as long as you do it at an early stage and, and keep the one that's accurate. There's no harm in doing that at all, especially if you've engaged or tried to engage with the developer before you've issued the notice. Mm. Uh, Marcus, uh, your, uh, your, your case study, I think, um, showed, showed the authority, I think, probably trying to be as helpful as it could be in what appeared to be a very difficult situation between <laughs> between the authorities' obligations and <laughs> adjoining landowners' views as to what should or shouldn't be out the back of their house, um, how how has uh, how has the uh, Vale of Glamorgan taken on board lessons in terms of helpfulness for, from uh, your case study? I think um, it's just trying in the first instance to uh, resolve something amicably without the need for a notice is something that. We've always done and always will continue to do i think i think that's an important part of the role um as well as serving notices it's resolving issues without formal action and um yeah that's something that we did try to do in that case um didn't work however um, in a lot of cases i've dealt with since it has i'd say in the majority of cases that works and i think it's very essential in our line of work to be able to do that to build a rapport with um site owners who were in breach of planning permission and then um, be able to make them realize that there is an issue that they perhaps don't actually see so they didn't in the case of my site you didn't think that there was any overlooking and when you tried to convince them of that it wasn't his problem so it was quite um, good to um, in, in a lot of cases people do come around to that way of thinking when you put the facts out and uh, yeah, I think that's quite beneficial and how we would continue in the future to uh, go on um, addressing cases. Mm. Um, we've got a question which I think uh, is, is an open question for, for everyone on the panel. Uh, given the power that inspectors have to alter uh, notices or uh, recorders in, uh, reporters, sorry, in, in, in Scotland, um, have you all found that uh, inspectors or reporters have become more pragmatic at dealing with small issues uh, or errors on notices? Or uh, are you finding uh, in your practice that there is uh, perhaps a hardening attitude towards smaller errors uh, or issues on notices? And perhaps if we, uh, if we go back to Tom uh, to start with that, what, uh, what, what, what's your experience at the moment with uh, flexibility of inspectors 
uh, of approaching they're, smaller issues on notices? I think that they're, they're, they're trying to be as pragmatic as possible and I think that's the correct approach because the the remedy is of course to quash the notice and in most cases that would lead to the reissue of another notice with the with the correction or whatever which just means that we're back to square one but six months later or, or whatever so I think it uh, inspectors are keen to avoid that scenario um, within the, the confines of their their remit um, mm. but certainly I, I wouldn't say I'd seen any change I, it's just been my experience that inspectors do tend to try and be quite quite pragmatic about that the, the key thing about amending a notice is whether or not it causes injustice to either party um, and that is something that inspectors are very keen to avoid yeah and so and certainly that's uh, that's been my experience that inspectors where they can tend to take a very uh, pragmatic and reasonable approach um, to matters uh, Be Beverly presumably in the in the course of your um, case study the reporter there um, would have liked to have been able to, to remedy uh, defects presented but but simply didn't find themselves able to yeah I think it was it was just really an unfortunate situation and maybe just one that we'd not come across before um, and I think you know Maybe that is lessons learned. Maybe picking up on some of the points Marcus said is, in terms of expediency, you know, the enforcement notice, you know, in, is always the last option, and an important part of the enforcement journey really is to regulate and control development. But that is, you know, first of and utmost through negotiation and having communication skills with those people who, who um, carry out the breach, along with the people who are complaining. So you can never keep everybody happy. You, you know, you're running a fine line, a balance between the two. And I think the decking shows a, a, an example of that. And I think that's where it's important. In my experience, I've worked with some um, wonderful planning enforcement officers who've been ex-policemen in the past. And the skills that they've had from their former job in terms of investigating and dealing with people and actually um, using their um, powers of persuasion to to resolve the vast majority of cases without without actually needing to take enforcement action is a really important part. And I think what we're looking at here is just um, there's always those cases we've got the tools um, to carry out enforcement action, so we can do it. But it is really it's a last resort, and there's there's lots of other ways of resolving it a lot quicker and saving us, ourselves a lot of time and resources. Mm. And uh, Marcus, there's a there's a slight sort of uh, follow-on and, and development of that uh, of that line of question in terms of flexibility from inspectors. Um, there's a further question about uh, flexibility or, or relaxation of enforcement in the the current pandemic climate. I don't know whether uh, you're able to uh, help us with perhaps either the Vale's view or the view of others or other authorities you've been discussing with. Uh, um, how to how to actually enforce in the current climate? I think um, the Welsh government um, quite early on issued um, a a letter to all um, managers of uh, planning departments in all councils across the country, and in that letter, the Welsh government outlined that we should we're operating hours for um, shops, and I think it might be takeaways as well. Um, are in place that we're lax on those where complaints are received because there were with uh, panic buying there was an immense struggle to keep stocks up things like that in shops so that came in quite early on with the pandemic um, and yeah so in some situations where we received complaints relating to operating hours we were more lenient and expediency comes into it in that case there is a breach it's clearly obvious and evident that they're operating beyond their hours however there is also a global pandemic ongoing and the weight has to be given to that and there's always a line where is the harm at a level where you need to take action and that line was taken back a bit by the material impact of a global pandemic and in that context i think that um, we yeah, had to choose not it wasn't expedient to take action against something that would have been an expedient to take some action against um, in 2019 for example I think yeah, I think that really sums it up essentially. No, well, thank yeah. you, thank you very much. Uh, I think that uh, brings us then to the end of our uh, session for today. I would like to thank very much all of the panelists for some great presentations and some uh, interesting exploration of the Q and A that we've had from the audience. And thank you very much to the audience for joining us today.
and uh, I look forward to seeing you all again soon at another RTBI event. Thank you very much. Thanks.